Okay, folks, we're going to go ahead and get started right at 12 o'clock. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We're in, um, everyone on the phone, we're actually broadcasting this live in front of uh, several of our clients in Winston-Salem. So welcome, everyone, and uh, welcome, everyone, on the phone for the Combustible Dust webinar, part two. Uh, part one was back in May. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with a quick safety moment. So uh, we're going to talk about fire extinguishers real quick with everyone, the weather getting cold, people having fires in their house, or everyone's cooking a little bit more now with Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, it's good to have a fire extinguisher that's not only um, current, but you know where it's at and you know how to use it. So to use a fire extinguisher, make sure you pull the pin, aim low at the fire, squeeze the lever, and sweep side to side. Make sure your fire extinguisher is rated for whatever you're trying to put out. Um, if you're trying to put out a, a, a cooking fire with oils, um, a type A fire extinguisher is not going to help you out much. So make sure that you have the right extinguisher for the right application. Okay, uh, just some housekeeping stuff. For the PDH credit, we have sign-in sheets that were emailed to all of our webinar folks. We have a sign-in sheet here. If you would please sign in uh, so we can get you your PDH credit. Uh, I'm requesting that you get these back to me by next Friday. The sooner the better, because with Thanksgiving come up, I'm sure PDH credits are not on everyone's mind. All right, so in review, like I said, we did our part one back in May, and at that time we talked about combustible dust, defined it, we looked at uh, deflagration and explosions, we identified some hazards, reviewed some codes and standards, and talked about some applications. So if you have a process that you're, you're grinding material or you're standing or shifting it around in any way, that all creates dust. So there are some applications, and we dove into some uh, some specific case studies, and this time around, we're going to have a quick introduction again, talk about some governing bodies, and take a deeper dive into 652. Our presenter today is Mr. Reed Todd again. Uh, he's our Winston-Salem managing engineer here, and for those of you who don't know, O'Brien and Gear, we're an engineering consulting firm. Uh, we do a lot of projects in heavy industry, and I'm going to turn it over to Reed now. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, for you guys listening on the phone, here's a picture. You can put a, a face to the voice here. That way you don't feel like you're left out. So we're going to talk today about the about NFPA 652 and the bodies governing combustible dust. And in the first presentation, I went through kind of the history of combustible dust. So today we're going to talk about the history of OSHA and the lawmaking bodies here. So the Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board, the CSB, OSHA, Congress, your insurers, FM Global, for example, their International Co-Cancel, and the National Fire Protection Agency, NFPA, these are the big players. To really understand the history of OSHA, you need to know about the Chemical Safety and Hazard Investigation Board. They were brought into being with the Clean Air Act in 1990, became operational in 1998. The CSB's mission is to drive chemical safety change through independent investigation to protect people in the environment, and the vision is a nation safe from chemical disasters. Um, three major industrial explosions in North Carolina, Kentucky, and Indiana. That's West Pharmaceuticals in North Carolina, CTA, CTA Acoustics in Kentucky, and Hayes Limmers International in Indiana. All of these were in 2003, and this really started the CSB train going here. So they did a nationwide study that encompassed these 
three disasters, plus they looked at the years from 1980 to 2005 and found that there were at least 281 dust incidents and resulting in some fatalities and injuries and um, loss of facilities. And just recently they have released a 2018 update. They were studying 105 incidents, 59 fatalities, 303 injuries. So this problem hasn't gone away. It's still here. And as a result of this study, the CSB made recommendations to OSHA to put in place some regulation to govern combustible dust. The, they also noted that the current sta NFPA standards work if they're followed. And what they were finding was that in most cases, housekeeping was not being followed. And that was the primary cause to the really bad incidents. If, if you do a good job with housekeeping, you can have a dust incident without leveling a facility. So their recommendations to OSHA were to issue a standard, provide training to OSHA state and federal uh, code enforcement folks, and while a standard is being developed, to issue a national emphasis program. So OSHA's response, they issued the National Emphasis Program in 2007. And this policy was put into place to give guidance to their enforcement folks to give them an idea of what to look for and how to enforce combustible dust standards without there being an official OSHA policy in place. So shortly after that, the most well-known combustible dust incident occurred. The Imperial Sugar Company in Georgia. This was well televised, and the CSB did an investigation on it. And if you're interested, if you go to csb.gov, they have lots of videos covering the three uh, incidents in 2003, as well as this one. Um, so since that happened, OSHA's response was to reissue the National Emphasis Program, adding some verbiage here that they have decided to intensify its focus on this hazard. So with OSHA, they are a body that is governed by the U.S. Congress. And they came out with the rulemaking in 2009, then they published it in 2009, then they had stakeholder meetings, and it was loosely approved through, through this. But by law, they are required to go through the Small Business Regulatory Enforcement Fairness Act. So this is where it's kind of been hung up since then. In 2010, it made the agenda, and then it's been on the agenda in 2014, 2015. In 2017, they took it off the agenda and cited other priorities have come up and were back burning the combustible dust policy. So now, is this a bad thing? Well, if they made a policy today, it would be frozen in time with the standards and devices and technology that is constricted to this day. And it takes an act of Congress to change the law, right? It's similar to PSM 1910.119 that chemical hazards must follow, where it's been the same since 1978 or whenever it was put into place. So is it a bad thing? It's bad in that OSHA doesn't it loses some power to affect change. But at the same time, it's good because the International Building Code is starting to 
referencing these standards, making them law, and it is a living document where as technology changes, as we learn more about the hazard, then we can adapt and change. The Combustible Dust National Emphasis Program, it was last updated in 2015. So just because there's not a OSHA policy here doesn't mean that they're not keeping track of the hazards and documentation associated with those hazards. The 2015 update was a minor one, bringing it in line with the global harmonization system. So you're referencing SDSs rather than MSDSs. Currently, there's 28 OSHA-approved state plans. So while OSHA federally doesn't have a policy, there are 28 state plans that are as strict or stricter than what they've laid out in the National Emphasis Program. So when they come in to do a, a site visit, and by they I mean OSHA, whenever OSHA comes in to do a site visit, they're going to take a look around. And even today, there are 18 standards, as well as the general duty clause, that they can cite. And these citations can reach into the thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, in 2017, Dyden Milling was cited for one million eight hundred thousand, uh, yeah, it went almost two million dollars in citations related to combustible dust. Also, the OSHA fines, they're continually increasing. They had a big increase in 2016, and at that point in time, they said, Instead of doing big increases all in chunks, we're going to go ahead and set a percent increase every single year. So OSHA fines increase every year percentage by percentage. And the CSB is investigating this uh, Dighton milling incident. It killed five people, 12 injuries, destroyed a facility. It's being investigated, and it's still currently under investigation. Um, so United States Congress legislation, which would give OSHA, well, which would force OSHA into setting up a policy, it's been in the House a few times, um, 2008, 2009, 2011, 2013. Out of all of these, only one of them made it through the House, and that was the one in 2008, which, you know, right on the heels of um, Imperial Sugar, that was it. It had the most momentum at that point in time to, to make it through. So the International Building Code, the IBC, the IFC, the IMC, these are the basis of the state building codes. And every state, and even sometimes cities within states, have their own. They, they choose to reference different years of the International Building Code. And uh, the most current International Fire Code references NFPA 652. So it's just a matter of time before the NFPA standard 652 is part of the building code law. So I guess I got ahead of myself here. This basically just summarizes what I just said. <coughs> um, other codes which refer to combustible dust, this is um, factory mutual, an insurer, and so the International Code Council, they're looking more at like life safety, and insurers are looking more at loss prevention. So they're similar, but <coughs> the building codes are really looking at how to save human life, whereas insurers are looking at how to save property, prevent fatality, 
So they're similar but different. Um, these are the NFPA standards that cover the mitigation prevention of combustible dust hazards. NFPA 499 is electrical classification. It goes with NFPA 70. They're referenced back and forth together. Uh, 68 and 69 are the two big ones for um, mitigation or suppression of combustible dust hazards. So NFPA 652 has become the master document for combustible dust hazards. And 654 covers pretty much everything else that's not covered by 61, 484, 664, and 655. 61 is agricultural dust, 60, uh, 664 is wood dust, um, 484 metal dust, and I personally haven't really done anything with sulfur fires and explosions, so I don't know that much about that one. But. NFPA 652. This is the master standard today, and um, there is talk of 654 and 652 being merged, and maybe one day it'll happen. It would make a lot of sense just because they're the two that are similar but different. Um, so we're going to go through this, uh, starting with administration. So the standard shall provide the basic principles of and requirements for identifying and managing the fire and explosion hazards of combustible dust solids. So anytime you're referencing or anytime you have a combustible dust, then you're going to be referencing NFPA 652. And then down here for purpose it says that you will follow this plus you'll follow any industry and comedy specific requirements. So if you have a combustible dust, you're looking at NFPA 652 and 654, or you're looking at NFPA 652 and NFPA 651. You don't get to choose. You have to follow both. So in something like that, typically you wind up following the most stringent requirement in whichever document that you're looking at. And NFPA 652 often tells you like how to do stuff and this com industry or comedy specific <laughs> gives you clarification on what NFPA 652 is wanting you to do. So they're not often are they in conflict and really out of all the standards they're pretty much the same anyway. So each one has its own little nuances but for the most part they're, they're very similar. So this standard shall apply to all facilities, operations that handle combustible particulate solids that also in that handling can generate combustible dust. Um, so milling, grinding, cutting, all of these uh, and material handling, like you're moving dust into your, or powder into your reactors, you know, all of these things require air material separators. So you'd always fall under NFPA 652 first, and then you'd be looking at your industry or comedy specific standard. Where an industry or company specific NFPA standard neither pro prohibits nor provides a requirement, always refer back to NFPA 652. That's why it's kind of a catch-all master document here. So retroactivity. The document is not retroactive unless NA H.J. sees something that's a concern to him in which he can enforce or force you to bring something up to meet the combustible dust standard. Um, so 
you have a fire marshal who comes in, you've not done any housekeeping, and he comes in and says, okay, you need to be following in FPA 652, section 6 for housekeeping. Okay, awesome. Now you've got to do it. The only, we'll get to it in a little bit, but there is a section within an FPA 652 for dust hazard analysis, which are retroactive, but we'll get there in a second. So, authorities having jurisdiction, an AHJ, so it's an organization, office, or individual responsible for enforcing the requirements of a code or standard, or for approving equipment, materials, an installation or a procedure. So, who might an HJ be? Here are some examples of authority having jurisdiction. So you have your state and local regulators, your fire marshals, your building code enforcement officials, uh, often through your state or <coughs> by county. Um, OSHA, your state and federal levels. And now, IBC-wise, these top two are really who um, are, are your AHJs for your building code and your fire code. Now, the way the standard's written, your insurer may ask you to follow some of these requirements as they become more educated on the hazard you know, FM has already got some stuff in place, but they could reference back to this, and yourself, your management, your members of your HS department, could it be AHJs, depending on what aspect they're looking at, if they're part of the DHAs, or in your management, you know, they are responsible for setting aside time and money to allow proper design for uh, equipment, and for allowing you to perform the DHA on your system to make sure it's safe. So, you know, they're responsible for your safety culture. Your EHS group is, you know, there to help. So general definitions, combustible particulate solid, that's any solid material that while it, it in its original shape, might not be, com be a combustible dust. If you handle it, it can create a combustible dust. So a real world example for this would be like Cheerios. If you have a handful of Cheerios and throw it up in the air, you can't blow that up, right? But if you emptied all the Cheerios out and you have the powder in the bottom of your Cheerio box, you could throw that up in the air and you could light it up. And that would be a combustible particulate solid, which is your Cheerio, and then a combustible dust, which is the ground the Cheerio. And then a DHA, a dust hazard analysis, and this is a review to identify fire, potential fire and explosion hazards, not only within your system, but also within your facility. So a lot of people, you know, they're like, okay, I've got this dust collector. I know i got to put some glass panels on it or chemical suppression. Okay, that's great. But sometimes they'll forget to look around the room itself, right? Are they doing a great job collecting fugitive dust, or do you see piles of dust laying around? You know, it's just a more guided method to make sure that you're looking at your full process instead of just the things that you think about are important at the time. General requirements, the owner-operator facility shall be responsible for the following activities. You have to keep your combustible dust explosivity data on hand. That's a requirement. So you need to know what its KST, Emax is. Two and three, those are covered by your DHA. And hazard communication is required in several other laws and standards outside of this one. But it is a requirement as well. The objectives in Section 4.2 shall be deemed to have been met by implementing either the following, a prescriptive approach or a performance-based approach. So 
either you're following all the belts and suspenders that they tell you to follow, or you're going to well document why you're not following some part of this. Or you're going to provide some other solution instead of all the belts and suspenders. Right? We'll get to this in a little bit. <coughs> so screening for combustibility or explosibility. Histor historical data is fine to use if you have it. There's a lot of things out there that have been tested over and over and over again. Um, NFPA 652 has a whole long list in it. And this is a good thing because <coughs> dust testing can be really expensive. Um, if you're doing the whole shebang worth of test, you could be looking at five to six thousand dollars for a set of tests. Um, if you know the dust is explosible, then it shall be permitted that it's combustible. Fine. This allows for a go no go screening test. Typically, I skip this because unless you're dealing with like glass dust or concrete dust, then almost everything else out there is going to blow up at some point in time. Um, if you want to try and save a little bit of money on the front end, you could go with a go no go test, but I feel like most of the time you wind up losing money because you run a go no go and you find out it goes and then you have to do all the testing anyway and then you've also paid for a go no go test. So that's just my two cents on that. Um, so what tests do you need? It depends on what you're trying to accomplish. The dust collector vendor is going to ask you for KST and Pmax. Um, and KST is just the deflagration index. And they've got this categorized depending on how high your KST is, whether it's a 1, 2, 3, 4, or a 1, 2, 3. 0 to 200 is 1, 2 is 2 to 300, 3 is more than that. So I don't put a lot of value on that as far as DHAs go because one of the worst and well-documented dust explosions we had was sugar, and it's got a low KST. So I, I don't, I'm sure it has its place, but as far as risk assessment, I don't put a lot of value on that. Uh, Pmax is how much pressure does the explosion generate, or deflagration generate, sorry, not an explosion. Um, and your dust collector vendors will take this da data and they can size release devices such that uh, it prevents um, your dust collector from exploding. So there is a difference between a deflagration and explosion. So some other properties would be your MIE, uh, your minimum emission energy, your minimum explosive concentration, your layer ignition temperature, and your minimum ignition temperature. So your MIE is talking about how much energy needs to go into a dust cloud to make it explode. This is really important because if what you're hoping for is you find that your dust cloud has a minimum ignition energy over static, right? Once you start getting into low MIEs, you have to do a lot of safeguarding of equipment, making sure that you know you can't create static hazards when you're unloading bulk bags or regular bags or even walking across the carpet, right? We all know that that can create a static charge. So now how are you going to prevent that from happening if you have an MIE that's less than one uh, millijoule, right? Very difficult. MEC, minimum explosive concentration. This is good, but sometimes not very useful information because there are ways that you can inject 
non-explosive material into your dust stream to make it so that it can't explode. But as far as just saying, okay, I'm never going to let the MEC get greater than whatever the MEC is, right? Well, how can you possibly ever measure that? You can't. You always look and say, okay, during the DHA, we have a release of dust. We're going to assume that it's greater than the MEC. There's no way to know whether it's higher than that or not. But there are techniques where this could be valuable information. The LIT, that's your layer ignition temperature. So you have a bunch of dust set on the veins of your pump or your pump motor. So how hot can that pump motor get before it becomes a problem? That's what that's measuring. And your minimum ignition temperature, same thing, except now you have a dust of, uh, of a cloud of dust around your light fixture in the ceiling. So how hot can that light bulb get before it <coughs> makes that dust go boom, right? Also, if you're using metal dust, you're going to need to run a resistivity test. And basically, that's how well the energy <coughs> leaves the dust, because you don't want energy to build, in, build up within metal dust, because that's a static hazard. So chapter six, performance-based design options. So this allows you to not follow the prescriptive requirements, but it requires a whole lot of documentation, um, all of this documentation to be exact. And chapter, not on this one. Um, so this is going step by step through your system, trying to decide if you need to follow every belt and suspender that you need, um, where your DHA would come into effect. And you're looking at um, fire modeling, explosion modeling, um, some things along those lines. And anytime you make a change to your process, you would need to reevaluate your entire system. So this is a, an option for you, but it's a lot of work. Your DHA is retroactive per NFPA 652. And in 2019 edition, that was, uh, 2019 edition came out in May 2018, this year. And the 2016 edition, which was the very, very first edition of, 20, of 652, came out in September of 2015. So in 2015, this DHA shall be completed by, that was September 7th, 2018. And with the 2019 edition, they bumped that out to 2020. I think they just did that to make it easier for everybody because it's a five-year reevaluation cycle. So I think they just thought that would be easier for everyone to remember if it's 2025, 2030. Um, the DHA shall keep the DHAs on hand for the HJs. Also, if you've never had an incident or a fire or a flash fire or an explosion, doesn't matter, that can't be a reason not to perform a DHA. That's not a safeguard, right? The fact that you've never had an incident is not a safeguard. If you have an a dust that has a KST greater than zero, a combustible dust, then you have to do a G DHA on all new and modified dust collection systems per NFPA 652. And all of your existing dust collection systems need to have a DHA performed on them by 2025. And this is where OSHA is not, can't come in and enforce that, but in the event that you had an incident, OSHA would be citing you for things along this line. Um, at some point in time, the fire marshals will probably start enforcing this through the 
uh, through the fire code whenever it becomes referenced into the fire code. So the DHA should be documented by a qualified person and you are looking at fire, flash fire, and explosion hazards. So if you have a fire, you have fuel, oxygen, and an ignition source. And then if you have a flash fire, you add on suspension of your fuel. And if you have an explosion, you've added on containment. So it steps through and looks at all three of these things as you move through the DHA. <coughs> Your process system is any part of the system that handles a combustible particulate solid. So everyone says, okay, well, I have a dust collector. We just need to look at that, right? Well, no, you need to go all the way back to your mill or your material handling system of how you're getting that powder into your reactor and look at each part of that, including the operator dumping that bag into that bag unloading station, right? So it is pretty comprehensive as far as stepping through and at every step you're evaluating, okay, what's my chances for a fire? What's my chances for a flash fire? What's my chances for an explosion? So this is where you really start to build where you need safeguards. So why do a DHA other than NFPA 652 says you have to? It's because controls are really expensive. So you want to be evaluating risk at every point and saying, yes, I need something. No, I don't need something. There are no credible ignition sources. My MIE is really, really, really high. And we've got procedures in place for no hot work. We have safeguards for sprinklers. We have a lot of other safeguards. So at this point in time, we don't need this particular safeguard. Let's take the next step. Okay, well, our duct is plastic. It's a pretty big static charge here. My MIE is really low. Okay, this is a problem. We need to do some work here. So <clears throat> the DHA is really helping you to establish which safeguards you need um, <coughs> and what you need and where do you need to put them in place. But it provide visibility to issues that need to be addressed because you'll go to a place and they'll say, oh yeah, our housekeeping is great. We do, we do housekeeping every shift. And you walk out there and there's piles of dust and the girds and you're like, no, this is bad. You guys really need to reevaluate this. So it's really just trying to bring visibility and when you start doing process design, you make an assumption that every one thing is working properly, and I'm combining all my dust into the dust collection system, my hoods are wonderful, they're collecting all the dust at my um, pickup points, but the DHA is really looking at what happens when the process fails, and making sure that you have all the safeguards around those failure areas as well. Um, we talked about insurers earlier. I think, you know, as they see more and more combustible dust incidents, you know, as I mentioned, there were 105 documented incidents in the last 11 years. So, you know, risk, prevention, loss prevention. Um, DHAs, they're very similar to PHAs back to OSHA 1910.119 if you're not familiar with that. But they allow for the use of what-if analysis, checklists, HAZOP, FEMA, fault tree analysis. Uh, team makeup is typically two to eight members. It depends on how complicated your system is. If you're putting in a single dust collector to pick up dust off of a grinding operation and that's all there is to it, it might just be 
a lead guy, a facili uh, facilitator who's scribing the VHA, and then your mechanical engineer or maintenance engineer, you know, working hand in hand on that. If you're putting in, you know, 50 pickup points and all taking them back to one really big dust collector, then you might be looking at six to eight people. It just <coughs> all depends on how complicated it is. So items to be covered, again, you're just looking at safe operating ranges. I keep on using MIE as an example because it's a great one, but like how much charge can be available before it's an issue? When at what point in time do we need to be putting in safeguards for that? Grounding or uh, bonding, whatever it may be. Um, <laughs> And also looking at your building and how dust propagates throughout your building. Consideration for an oxidizing atmosphere, that's not typically something that you evaluate because oxygen is always present and it's just really expensive to try and inert a dust collection stream. Um, credible ignition sources and cred credible suspension mechanisms. Management systems, this is very similar to PSM as well. Uh, big one here is management of change because it's really labor and time intensive to make sure you're doing a really good job managing your change, right? People go out all the time and say, well, I'm going to close this valve, right? Well, if that valve has to be open to maintain minimum transport velocities in your dock, then you could have a real big problem. So that, that one is, to me, one of the harder things to really be disciplined within your company on. Um, and housekeeping is important here because not only is that, okay, you have to have a well-documented housekeeping program that you're following and documenting that you're following, but you also have to document that you've trained your employees on your housekeeping program. So a lot of this stuff is just labor intensive and administrative wise, I guess. You, you need to be well disciplined to be, to be following this section. Inspection, tape, testing, and maintenance. This is really talking about all of your control devices. Um, again, housekeeping is up here. But Anything that can be a, uh, a potential source for ignition, so you're talking about your LIT, your MIT, you know, uh, are you maintaining purging on electrical cabinets if you're inside a class area? You know, all of these things have to be inspected, tested, and your maintenance program has to be well documented, and you have to document that you have trained your employees on the systems that you have in place. So chapter nine is mitigation and prevention. So you have a, a combustible dust, and then you have a ignition source, and then you have a dust explosion, and then you have an impact, which can be fatalities, injuries, plant closings, fines, lawsuits. So prevention, is stopping the ignition source from causing the dust to light up. And then mitigation is once the dust is lit up, how do you handle that so that it, you don't have the impact? So an example of mitigation would be a blast panel on the dust collector. You have a dust explosion, but you vent that hazard away so there's no impact on the dust collector. <clears throat> Prevention would be more like the suppression systems in dust collectors where it sees a spark and it chemically inerts the atmosphere so that there is no explosion. So inherently safer design, this is what they want you to do when you look at designing a system. So they want you to use less when possible or do the process less when possible. 
So if you have a hazard, instead of doing it 15 times a day, figure out how to do it once. If your process takes 1,000 pounds of this combustible dust, figure out how to do it in 10 pounds, right? Substitution, can you get, make that combustible dust go away and replace it with something safer? Uh, moderation and simplification. Um, simplification is how do you make your process simpler. Moderation is how can you do it uh, safer. So building design requires a documented risk assessment uh, acceptable to the AHJ. Probably in this case, the AHJ is looking at your building code enforcement official or your fire marshal. And they would prefer you to do segregation, separation, separation or detachment. So segregation would be putting up like firewalls between your dust collection room um, or your material handling room. So if you're using bulk bags and you're dumping them into some kind of pneumatic transportation system, they would prefer you to put that in an area unto itself separate from everything else. Um, separation, you have to separate things pretty far to classify for separation. And then detachment is similar to separation, but not so far. So equipment design, uh, we've talked about this on and off now with glass panels or suppression systems and dust collectors, but there's a lot of other um, duct devices like one-way valves or suppression systems for duct that can prevent the mitigation of a flame front. So all of these things are things that need to be taken into account. Dust control, referring to fugitive dust. So no matter how great you are with dumping that bag of dust into your um, bag and dump bin, chances are there's going to be some dust either you know, you see people dump the bag, and then when they're turning around, it's just dropping the trash can, they flip it a little bit, and you know, you get some dust coming out, or you tie the neck of a super sack, and you squeeze it, and dust squirts out any holes. So, you know, how well are you collecting your fugitive dust is a big part of the housekeeping effort also. So that's something that you got to take a look at. Uh, explosion prevention and protection, 68 and 69. This is the most straightforward and most complicated thing all at the same time. Because there's lots of options out there. There's lots of vendors selling you lots of options. And it's, it's easy to put everything, but these systems are expensive. So you want to make sure you're using the right one for you. And you want to make sure that it's sized appropriately for you and for your dust. So if you have a dust collector that's running fly ash and you want to put in a dust, and you want to take that same dust collector and use it for sugar dust, then you're going from, you know, your KSTs matter, your Pmaxes matter, and now your explosion protection devices might not be sized appropriately for your new use. So that's always something you have to keep in mind. And the last part is fire protection. All right, so the CSB continues to investigate combustible dust explosions. In 2017, they have an um, incident investigation that's ongoing right now, today. And they are still making recommendations to and that's really what the CSB does. They're an uh, independent investigation committee. They make recommendations to the industry and to OSHA and to others. And then they document um, their completion. And those recommendations have been fulfilled. So they believe that there's a threefold process here, education, regulation, and enforcement. So Education, the hazards must be understood. Regulation is for OSHA to regulate this hazard. And enforcement, that's for OSHA to enforce this hazard. 
And OSHA has been educating their state and local enforcement agents. So every conference you go to, there are OSHA folks there. OSHA funds continue to rise and inspections continue, and this can be expensive to you. So keep that in mind. The ICC has adopted NFPA 652, uh, and it's just a matter of time for the states to follow suit. And NFPA recommends that companies control fugitive dust emissions, design of facilities to prevent dust from migrating and accumulating. That would be separation, segregation, and detachment. And perform rigorous housekeeping to remove any dust that does build up. So that's the single biggest thing that any company can do for themselves, would be housekeeping, housekeeping, housekeeping. Are there any questions? Any questions in, in the house? Uh, we had a few come in. Um, a few come in. Um, any idea when the fire code will accept 652? <laughs> The IFC has already referenced NFPA 652, and the state building codes reference the IFC, so it's just a matter of time and how your state moves forward with uh, adopting its own fire codes. Um, next question is, are DHA is required to be done by third parties. I don't think so. Um, actually, the answer is no. They're not required to be done by third parties. So long as you have a facilitator that's familiar with the methods being performed, the only nice thing about having a DHA done by a third party is that you get to spread the risk around instead of taking all the risk onto yourself. So okay. And the uh, last question is if, if we can uh, share these slides with folks and the answer is of course. Um, we'll be happy to email these out <coughs> and I'd uh, like to thank everyone for coming today. If you have any more questions, feel free to uh, email Reeves or myself and um, We'll wrap that up. All right, thank you. Thank you.